It's summertime, so I can preach for two hours, right, Pastor Brian? That's right. No, I'm just kidding. Not going to do that. If you would, just bow your head one more time as we get ready to open up God's word, and let's invite God's spirit to speak to us. Father God, we thank you for your loving grace that you've given us a new day to live for you. And Father, we pray in this moment that you would block out any distractions in our hearts and our mind, that we would be able to focus on your spirit, to hear your spirit speak to us, Father. And we pray that your spirit would do a work of grace in our hearts and in our minds, and it's all for your glory. Amen. So now how many of you in here have any kind of social media contact. You might have social media accounts, you might have looked at social media, right? So we all have this social media that seems to be everywhere. And have you ever seen anybody that has a social media facade where they post their life and it's not really their real life? Where there's these people where they're posting, I'm living my best life now, yet you know in fact that they're really not living their best life. And we see pictures, exciting pictures of people where it's like, we're celebrating our 20 years of marriage, but their marriage is a hot mess and they actually hate each other each and every single day, right? But on social media, they're the most loving couple you've ever seen. Or you have somebody, I love what I do, I love my job, but then every day, I hate my job, I hate what I do, I can't believe I have to go there, I can't believe Monday's coming tomorrow, I don't want to live anymore. And it's like, wow, that's not who you are, you don't love your job. Or you have somebody that's like, I love my children, yet they just yell at their children all day long, they belittle their children, they berate their children. Or you have some people where it's like, hey guys, here's a picture of me, I'm hanging with my squad. Yet these people are all alone and don't ever go out and have any social interaction. And there's a facade. There's pictures we put on social media that hide the real us, the real me. And so I, I have to tell you, I have to be honest, there is a picture of me that's a facade. And so uh, me, Kelly, and our friend Elena went to San Diego Zoo. And there's a picture of those three of us right there. And they're all laughing, ha, 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 yay, we're having so much fun. And you can tell my face, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to fake this one because they decided, hey, Brad, since we walked from one side of the zoo to the other, let's go on this thing called the Skyfari where you get in this little thingy that you sit in and it takes you really high up into the clouds on the cable and it'll just get us to the other side of the zoo, no problem. It's not that high, it's barely above the trees and now... Here's what you have to know about Brad. Brad hates heights. No, I don't hate heights. I'm petrified of heights. I'm terrified of heights. And there's this little weird thing where if I'm ever anywhere up high, I feel like I'm going to run and jump off and fall to my death. And so I'm petrified of being up high. And so they're like, it's really not that high, Brad. So this picture is us about to go on the sky fari. <laughs> So we get up in this thing, and it's literally in the clouds. And they want to take pictures. They're moving around. I'm like, sit down. Do not move. They're like, come on, Brad, take a picture. I am not taking any pictures. I am not moving because if I move and this thing sways and rolls over and I fall off the ledge, I'm coming after both of you. And so I'm not doing any of that. So I sat, there's no pictures. I tried to find one. That's the only picture we could find because I didn't allow them to take pictures of us. But on social media, if you look at it, man, we were having a great time. <laughs> Everybody thought, no, oh, that was Sky Fari was so fun, wasn't it, Brad? Not one bit. And I, the next time we go, I don't care if we have to walk 10 miles. I will not put myself in that little cable box of death, okay? That's the last time we will walk 100 miles. And so, but here's why I bring that up is because social media, it's easy for us to just highlight our good things. I mean, you never, put, you never see somebody really post on there, hey, I was just a jerk to my wife. I'm sorry, spouse. You, you don't ever see that. We don't see the real us. We just put what we think others will appreciate and be encouraged by and be excited by. And so many times we're not real with that. But in the same way, when it comes to our sin, when it comes to our failures, we too put up a social media facade when it comes to our relationship with God. Do we not? Instead of God's people coming before the merciful and gracious presence of God, we just kind of avoid that when we've had sin and failures in our life and we step back and it's like, hey God, everything's good. We kind of do just like a little drive by, Ch -ch -ch, God, I'm good. You know, everything's fine over here. I don't need to go into your presence, God, because I'm good. I don't need anything. I, I can do this on my own. I can handle my failures on my own. And we're not real with God. And when it comes to this idea of confession, which is what the title of this message is called, we don't confess because we try to put on this, this we're afraid that if God sees the real us, that if God sees the real failures in our life, that he won't want anything to do with us anymore. And what ends up happening with us is that we don't confess and our relationship with God is hindered. 
because we feel if God knew the real us, he might crush me for my failures. And then we never confess. We live life. Guilt and shame creep their ugly head into our lives. And instead of this love of God and the grace and mercy of God drawing us to him, our fear and guilt and shame and regrets keeps us further and further away from God's presence. Have you wrestled with your own failures? Have you found that no matter how much you desire to please God, you still end up failing? You see, the Apostle Paul understood this with humanity, that every single one of God's people struggles with their failures. Yes, we're saved by grace, but the sinful nature still comes out and rears its ugly head into our lives. And and this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Oracles of God is the covenant of God. It's the promises of God. God's saying, I'm going to bring a blessing through my people, Israel, and they're going to be a blessing to the nations, and salvation will go to the entire world through my people. And the Jews had the oracles of God. They were to take this good news of a loving king who would be their God for the rest of the world. And he says this, these people who had the oracles of God, and he asked this question, what if some were unfaithful? And then he follows it up. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? You see, all of us in here, we're going to fail. We're going to sin. It's going to happen to us. We, the church, the people who have the good news, the great news that Jesus is king and Jesus can make your life right, we have the greatest news, the oracles of God. But what if some of us were unfaithful? Now, you know how easy it is to get into failure? You can go zero to 60 from saint to sinner just driving down Taft Street, right? Doesn't take you long. Have somebody cut you off in traffic, and all of a sudden, failure comes into your life. Doesn't take long for us to fall into sin. And the failure can be whatever that failure is. Understand that God knows that these are going to happen. And here's the question. Does that stop the faithfulness of God? Does it nullify the faithfulness of God? Does it cancel out? Does it stop? Does it thwart the faithfulness of God in your life? Paul wants us to answer that question with the hard no. Our failures do not stop the faithfulness of God, but there is a healthy way to maintain our relationship with God when failures do creep in, and that is with confession. And today we're continuing our series, Praying Scripture, and we're going to learn that, man, it's important to make confession a daily habit in our spiritual lives. And today we're going to understand how we can have a healthy perspective when we do fail. And here's the truth that I want you to to hold on to today if you don't hold on to anything else today. Get this down. You can write it down in your notes. It's what the blanks are for in the outline you got this morning. It's this. God is for us even in our failures. God is for us even in our failures. And this morning we're going to be in Psalm 51. So if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn there. And for those of you who don't know the backstory to this, to this psalm, let me just kind of set the scene for you about what is happening before we really dive into what's going on in Psalm 51. Israel had God leading them, and God was their king. And Israel began to look around at all these other nations, and he began to, they began to realize, like, wait a minute, the Egyptians, they have a human king, The Assyrians, they have a human king. Every other nation around us has a human king. God, we don't have a human king. And God's like, yeah, but you got the king, me, right here. I'm the perfect king. I'm the holy king. I'm the righteous king. Yeah, but we don't want you, God. We want a human king. So God says, okay, you want a human king? I'll give you a human king. Just understand the human king is going to have trouble and is going to have failure so they choose king god chooses king saul to come into place and he rules over israel israel's like yeah we got our human king yay all is good well it doesn't take long for king saul to fail and all of a sudden people like oh no our human king has failed what are we going to do so god says here i'm going to choose a guy i'm going to choose another king to take saul's place when he dies and he found this guy named david who was out shepherding sheep and he had killed a lion had killed a bear through his faith in God and God says look I have 
found a man after my own heart, and he's going to be king. So King Saul dies, David comes in, and David is reigning over Israel, and Israel's like, yeah, we got a human king. Our king has a heart after, has a heart after God's own heart. This is awesome. Great things are happening. Well, then David goes out on his rooftop one night and sees a lady Bathsheba bathing, and he tells his guards, hey, I want that girl to come in. He brings her in, lays with her. She's married to another man. Failure creeps in even to Israel's king. And then she gets pregnant. Now it's gone from bad to worse. So then he tries to convince Bathsheba's husband, you need to go in and you need to go lay with your wife, be with your wife. You've been gone for her for a while, go lay in, because he's trying to make everything the timing right. So it's like, oh yeah, that's really your baby, Uriah, because you went in at the same time. Well, Uriah is being faithful to his post as a soldier, says, I'm not going to do it. How can I do that when the other soldiers are out here? I'm staying put. And David's like, okay, well, you know what? Since you're not going to go and do my plan, I'm going to send you to the front lines. Sends Uriah to the front lines. He gets killed in battle. David The king, a man after God's own heart, has committed adultery and now has committed murder. Ultimate failure in David's life. Then God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David one night. He tells David a story and at the end of the story he tells David, you are the man of that story. You're the one who has done wrong before God. And then David tells the prophet, I have sinned against the Lord. And how did David respond once Nathan came to him? What did he do with his failures? Did he run and hide? Did he try to push it away? Did he try to to run from what he was supposed to do? How he responded was confession. And Psalm 51 is the prayer of confession that David offered up to God after Nathan pointed out his failures before God. So look at verse 1 with me in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So what confession teaches us is that our relationship, when our failures come in, our relationship with God is affected. Because we immediately become, the Holy Spirit convicts us, And there's this guilt and there's this shame that's there. And if we never deal with that, if we never confess that, it hinders us. Have you ever been in a place where you didn't confess your sin? Did it make you want to draw near to God or far from God? It makes you want to draw far from God. You stop spending time in the Word. You stop spending time praying because it's like if I go and do those things, God's going to spank me with a divine paddle. And I don't want God to spank me with a divine paddle, so I'm going to avoid him at all costs. And so here, our relationship gets affected, but David, he he approaches God, and the first thing that David calls upon is this. He doesn't call upon and say, David, David doesn't sit there and go, God, oh, judge-worthy God, oh, vicious God in heaven. Is that what he says? Calls upon God's mercy, calls upon God's steadfast love. Yes, God is righteous. Yes, there's consequences for sins, but God is David's father. God is your father. God's my father. And when we sin, he is a merciful God. He is a loving God who will treat us like a father treats their children. You see, David wants us to realize that when we sit before our father in heaven, and we go to confess those sins and our failures in our life, is to realize that this is a God who cares about us. This is a God that is for us even in our failures. This is a God who is not surprised by your failure. He's not surprised that you are fragile. He's not surprised that temptation has overcome you. He is there to bring that relationship back in order with you. And so when we go to confess, we have to keep in mind, man, we have a merciful and loving God who is telling us, in the midst of your failure, come to me. Tell me, admit it to me, so that our relationship can be maintained, that there is nothing that hinders us. But many times we get afraid of our failures. 
We get afraid because we, we view God sometimes as this big, angry, despot God who as soon as you mess up, God's ready to punch you in the face. And then we don't approach God with our failures, and then the sin gets worse. The sin becomes habits, and the habits become to this place where we feel like, there's no way I can get out of this. How can I get out of my sin? And it's because we, we don't get out because we don't confess it to our loving Father. Are there consequences to our sin? Sure. David faced a few consequences, right? He sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, but he also, God told him, look, because of this failure, the sword is never going to leave your family. The throne that was to be established forever, which he told David, you have the promises of God, I'm going to establish your throne forever. He also told him, because of that failure, there's going to be fighting amongst your family, and you look at David's life, his one son tried to kill him towards the end of his throne, of his reign. And so there's consequences. There's another consequence that David had where he said, look, the baby that Bathsheba is going to bear is going to die. And he lost his firstborn son. There's consequences. If I go out one day and decide to cheat on Kelly, there are consequences. She's going to stab me in the neck. And then there's going to be the outfall upon everything else that goes with that. Sin has natural consequences. But we have to look at it as so many times we think that it's God being mean, that it's God being angry with us. But no, we have to think of it in terms of God disciplining his children like a father disciplines his children. I don't have children, but I talked to a friend of mine the other day and he told me this and it made me really stick upon this because he said, Brad, he's like, the way God treats us in our failures is the same way that I treat my kids. He's like, when my kids misbehave, when they fail, he goes, sure, I correct them, but I love them. And I correct them so they don't put themselves in harm again. And he's like, I'm going to tell you right now, Brad, there is nothing my kid could ever do to make me hate them. There is nothing my kid could do to make me stop loving them. I will always care about them no matter what they do, where they've been, because I love my children. You see, and if an earthly father a fragile, broken father can love their children in the same way? Imagine the love of our heavenly father that he has for you in the midst of your failures. See, the writer of Hebrews says, God disciplines those whom he what? He loves. And so sure, yeah, our sin brings consequences. But when we confess and we say, God, I come to you, I admit my sin, we have a God of mercy and grace and love who is ready to forgive because God is for us even in our failures. And then David goes on and he confesses his sin. After he calls upon the mercy and love of God, he admits it. He says, God, I have sinned. I have failed. And he calls it sin. He calls it transgression. He doesn't justify it. He doesn't try to make excuses for it. He doesn't try to sugarcoat it like it really wasn't that bad, God. Like when I yelled at that person the other day, I could have been way worse. I could have said a bunch of curse words. I only said one. No, there's, there's no justifying. He calls it, man, that was sin. That was transgression. I missed the mark. I've blown it. I've utterly failed. And then he says, God, but ultimately I have, I have sinned and I've offended you and you alone. Yeah, sure, he offended Bathsheba. Sure, he offended Uriah. But he admits to God, ultimately, Father, I have sinned and I have offended you, my heavenly Father in heaven. You see, David teaches us the importance of calling our sin what it is. And many times we make excuses or justify the sin in our life. And we can say things like, well, you know what? God just made me like this. That's why I do this. I, I can't, God, I really can't change because you just made me, you just wired me this way, this is how I am. Or we say things like, well, I'm just an angry person and that's always who I am and I'm always going to be angry. No, that's an excuse. It's justification for that sin to stay in your life. Well, you don't know what the other person said about me, Brad. If you would have known what they said to me, then I'm justified in responding back. No, it's sin. It's transgression. Well, you don't know the environment I live in. The environment produces these attitudes and behaviors in me. And if you, no, it's an excuse. It's a justification we have to be honest and call that sin what it is. God, I've offended you. This is a sin. This is a failure in my life. Be specific with it. If it's like, man, you gave your wife an attitude, God, I apologize. I confess that I gave my wife an attitude. I admit that. I failed in that. Because David understood that when he confessed, 
it will affect his relationship with God, but he, real, he knew, too, that confession, when you admit that sin, when you admit that failure, that confession leads to restoration. Look with me at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall, shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. David starts it off and he mentions this, purge me with hyssop. Does anybody have any idea what he's talking about? Purge me with hyssop. When I read that phrase, I'm like, that's so weird. Like, who even says the word hyssop nowadays? And so I'm looking at that and I did some research on it. But here's what, scripture, you can go back to, you can read this passage for fun, Leviticus 14. You can jot that down, you can go back, read it later. But purging with hyssop, here's the idea behind it, okay? When there was somebody who had leprosy, that was kind of like a disease. And when you had leprosy, what happened to you? Were you allowed to stay in camp? Nope. You were kicked outside of camp. Get out. You need to leave. You're contagious. You're sick. And we don't want you to infect the whole rest of us. So you're kicked outside of where God's people were living. But then when God brought healing to you as a leper, there was a process that led to you being restored. And this process was when somebody had been cleansed of leprosy, in the temple, the priest would sprinkle, would purge them with hyssop and declare that this person was cleaned and, has, and is now allowed to come back into the camp, allowed to come back into God's fold, into God's presence with the people of God. So what is David saying here? Why is he mentioning this? Well, David is mentioning that because of his failure, because of his sin, he has become a spiritual leper. And what David is mentioning here is, I can't cleanse myself. Many times when we wrestle with our own sin and we don't confess, do we not try to do our best to modify our behavior? Well, I'm just going to tackle this on my own. I'm going to pull my bootstraps up and I'm going to tighten them, I'm going to tie the laces, and I'm not giving in to this temptation this time. Well, have you prayed about it? No, I don't need to pray about it. I, I got my boundaries in place. Well, I think you should really confess it. No, I'm good. I got this. And then immediately you fall back into that sin and that failure over again. You cannot clean the spiritual leprosy in your heart. And this is what David is calling upon. He's saying, God, I need you to do something for me that only you can do. I need you to cleanse me from my sin and from my failures. And then David says, God, when you cleanse me, when you purge me, when you declare me clean, Father God, check this, my heart will be what? Whiter than what? Snow. That is amazing. Because here's what I know. I'm a human being just like everybody else in here, and I've had this happen in my life where I have this nice little white heart, and then all of a sudden sin comes in and destroys my heart and destroys my life, and then when I look at myself, all I see is the black marks and the black stain, and my failure is all that I have before my mind. Now, that's, that's a good thing because the Holy Spirit convicts us and puts us there, but many of us, when that failure comes before our hearts and minds, this is how we define our life. And all we see is our failure. And all we begin to think about ourselves is, man, there's no way I could go to God because I've blown it. I've messed up. Now God's not going to want anything to do with me because look at how I failed. I really blew it this time. God's going to want nothing to do with me. I, I've blown it again over and over and over again. I'm a failure. And church, as the people of God, we're not helpful when someone's in this place. Because we like to point out the faults in everybody else as well. I can't believe you did that again. I can't believe you'd acted like that. How dare you? And then somebody gets stuck in their failure, and all they see is this. And they don't approach God because they feel like God's going to want nothing to do with me. But you see... The scriptures tell us a story about our failure. When God looks at us, what does he see? Say it again. 
sees the love of Christ, right? Sees the blood of Christ. And what has the blood of Christ done for you? Oh, the blood of Christ has washed you clean. You see? This is what we see. Our hearts are white as snow. But it's something only Christ can do in your heart. It's you confessing that you have sinned and offended God and putting your faith in Jesus Christ that makes your heart white as snow. And David understood that, man, God, when you cleanse me, when you restore me, man, this is how you see me. I'm your child. I'm, I'm justified. I'm sanctified. I'm glorified. And the truths of Scripture say that, that he has separated our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. The New Testament says that Jesus took the debt that stood against us, the record of debt, and he nailed it to the cross and paid for it all. And we have to change our mindset when we fail, when we sin. God loves you, and God is for you even in your failures. Don't allow your failure to keep you from going to God and confessing because God desires to cleanse you. God desires to restore you. Yes, it's a process. Yes, it doesn't happen immediately. But when God brings you through the cleansing process, David says, when you cleanse me, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Gladness will come back into my life. You see, this is what confession is all about, is restoring our relationship with God so that we can have that joy back, so that we can have the gladness returned into our life. Don't allow your failures to keep you from going to God and confessing your sins. And Jesus looked at, God looked at the world and saw, you look at scripture, every single human being that is ever born fails. Then he chooses the people of Israel. Here's my people going to have the oracles of God. And what happens to them? They fail. Then he chooses kings. And those human kings, they fail. And so the world is trapped and everyone's failing. What are we going to do? Well, remember, God's for us even in our failures. And he sends Jesus Christ to live the perfect life, to be the true servant of God, so that all who place their faith in them can be healed and can be cleansed. So God desires to cleanse us. God desires to cleanse the world. And confession is part of this process that restores our heart. And David cries out, God, create in me a clean heart. Renew my spirit. And he mentions that God requires truth in the inner being. That You might say, what does that mean? That means us saying, God, I've blown it. Being honest and being truthful and saying, God, I need you to do what I can't. Give me wisdom. And the disciple John says this, for all of us as Christians, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Scriptures also say that he who began the good work in you is what? Faithful. So what if we are unfaithful? Does that nullify the faithfulness of God? Never that. Never that. But we confess it to see God continue the work that he began in us. Here's the last part, and we'll close with this. Confession also restores our mission. Look at me with, at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite or crushed heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David shows us that when we confess our sin, God cleanses us, but then he restores our mission. Look at what David says. He says, I'll do three things. God, when you restore me, when you lead me through that healing process, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach transgressors their way. 
I'm going to tell them about you. I'm going to tell them about your mercy. I'm going to tell them about your love so that these sinners can also come and return to you. Not only that, but God, when you cleanse me, I'm going to sing aloud your praises for everyone to hear. I'm going to use the gift of music you've given me so that the world will know of your great name. And then I'm going to declare your praise from my mouth. David's restoration returned him to his mission. David understood that his restoration through confession was not just about him. It wasn't just to make him feel good. It wasn't just to be this personal thing only for him. He recognized that he was restored to be back on God's purpose, reigning as king to tell the world about the true king who lives in heaven. And so today, what encouragement can we get from that? Here it is for you today. God will use you even though you fail. Amen? I've seen so many people, the moment they fail, walk away from God and walk away from the church because they feel like God could never, ever use them again because of the failure in their life. That's a lie the enemy puts in your mind to keep us off mission. Because it's not the God we serve. Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus said, but upon you, Peter, I will build my church. God knows our weaknesses. He knows we fail, which is why before the foundation of the world, God knew that he was going to send his son to die for every single sin and failure you have committed and you will commit. Paid for. It's done. God can use you even when you fail. Does that excite you? Does that make you wonder, like, man, how loving is this God? That he would use me, a broken vessel, who fails many times. You see, our failures never stop the faithfulness of God. God remains faithful to us when we are faithless to him. He who began the good work is faithful to complete it in you. And God is not through with any of you yet. He has a purpose for you on this earth, and your failures do not keep him from using you on mission. You see, God wants us all to hear this, that when we find this moment where we've sinned, and this needs to be something we do daily, because we, it's easy for us to fall. And when we add this habit of saying, God, here's where I've sinned, here's where I've blown it with you, God, cleanse me. And then he puts you back on mission to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. There's no, I have to wait for a year. There's no, I gotta take a training class. No. When God restores you, when you confess and God restores, it's immediately, love God, and how can I love my neighbor as myself? So I'm going to give you three practical things that you can pray with this psalm, Psalm 51, and they'll be on the screen for you as well. Here we go. Adding confession to our lives. Pray about our sin. Pray about our mission. God, what, is it, what are you calling me to do in your kingdom work? And then thirdly, God, what do you have for me to do today? Confess your sins, pray about your mission, and pray about how God can use you today because God is for us even in our failures. So I want you to bow your hearts and minds as we close this morning. And as the worship team comes out, I just want to throw out there, if there's anything that's on your heart and mind that you're sitting there, maybe there, you felt like you've been a failure, maybe you felt like you've blown it so many times and you've never had time of confession the altars are always open for you to confess there's nothing to be embarrassed about we're all broken this is why we're at church because we all know we're sinners we all know we're in desperate need of God's grace and only God can cleanse us and only God can empower us and so if you're sitting there and you've never confessed that sin that failure today's the day go down to the altar your loving father is standing there with his hand out ready to restore ready to give love and ready to give grace and then after confessing, get back up, be encouraged, love God, and love your neighbor. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us how great you are. Father, we see that you are a merciful and loving God, that even in our failures, Father, even while we're still sinners, you loved us and sent Jesus to die for us. And Father, we thank you that when we confess our sins to you, that you do bring healing, that it never stops your purpose in our life, and that you continue to use us for your honor and for your glory. Lord, do in us what we can't do in ourselves, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.